Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Jeff Kirkovius. Jeff was born in Kelowna, BC, Canada, and completed his bachelor's degree at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. Under the supervision of Professor Frederick Menard, he worked on the synthesis of fluorescent dyes for labeling voltage-gated calcium channel proteins. Jeff then moved to Ontario to attend the University of Western Ontario, where he obtained a master's degree under Professor Michael Carr, and also completed the total syntheses of several calcium alkaloids. Jeff then came to the Reisman lab at Caltech to pursue the total synthesis of C19 diterpenoid alkaloids and lupin alkaloids. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for the kind introduction, Matt, and giving me a chance to present my work on your channel. My work is focused on the total synthesis of lupin alkaloids. Now, lupin alkaloids are based around a quinolizidine core, and they can come in bicyclic, tricyclic, or tetracyclic motifs. Two of the most famous members of the tetracyclic lupin alkaloids are both matrine and spartine. Matrine has been shown to have some really interesting broad biological activities, and spartine has been really useful for chemistry for asymmetric deprotonations. This chemistry was well developed by Peter Beek back in the 1990s. Due to the utility of these alkaloids, we were interested in pursuing a total synthesis of them. And we were really inspired by the biosynthesis of the lupin alkaloids to guide our chemical synthesis. And in the biosynthesis, it's thought that two equivalents of piperidine imine are cyclized together with lysine and through a divergent pathway give access to either spartine or matrine. Now, we thought we could simplify this and use pyridine as a stable, inexpensive synthon for piperidine imine and use glutaryl chloride instead of lysine as our linker and to act as an activating agent for pyridine. We hypothesized that pyridine and glutaryl chloride could react to give a bidirectional pyridinium enolate, which could then form the tetracyclic scaffold of spartine in a single step. We could then perform a global reduction to give us access to the natural product. And we initially tried this reaction where we took glutaryl chloride and pyridine in DCM at low temperatures and warmed it up, and we were really excited to see that we got a compound by NMR that had seven alkene peaks. But if you'll notice, this has eight alkene peaks. And so curious as to what we had actually formed, we got an x-ray structure, and we found instead that we would gotten a 30% yield of a scaffold of the matrine-type alkaloids, which has a stereochemistry to match isomatrine. And this motivated us to pursue a total synthesis of the matrine-type lupin alkaloids. Matrine itself has shown to have a lot of different biological activities, the majority of which have been oncological. And in the past two decades, there's been over a thousand publications concerning the mechanism of action of matrine and its targets in biological setting. For our proposed synthesis route to matrine, we were inspired again by the biosynthesis. And so in the biosynthesis, after the complete tetracycle of the natural product is formed, it is completely reduced to this diamine skeleton. This is then oxidized to the natural product selectively. So we propose, since we have already got our tetracycle in hand, which has all of the carbon framework of matrine installed, we could do a complete global reduction to access this diamine, followed by a late-stage oxidation selectively to access isomatrine. From there, we could epimerize isomatrine into both matrine and allomatrine, which was reported in its isolation paper. The first thing we set out to do for our synthesis was to optimize the reaction between pyridine and glutaryl chloride, and we quickly found that this reaction was highly robust and very scalable. We could perform the reaction on a one mole scale to yield over 160 grams of product in a single batch. And what was really nice is the purification of this product was a simple filtration of the crude reaction mixture with no column or no workup necessary. The cyclization reaction between pyridine and glutaryl chloride really made us curious as to what the actual mechanism was for this reaction. And we initially hypothesized that pyridine and glutaryl chloride could reversibly form this bis acylpyridinium enolate. The enolate could do a 1-2 addition into the adjacent pyridinium ion, which gives us this monocyclized product here. We could then get a manic-type cyclization of this electron-rich diene into the remaining pyridinium ion to give the tetracyclic scaffold of the matrine-type lupin alkaloids that we get from the cyclization reaction, with the final step of the mechanism being a deprotonation. Now, by NMR, the major species at 25 degrees Celsius was this monocyclized compound, and the major species at negative 40 degrees Celsius was this bispyridinium, which proved that our mechanistic hypothesis was probably on the right track. We computationally also looked at this mechanism, and we couldn't find any evidence for concerted 2 plus 2 or concerted 4 plus 2 pathway to form the tetracyclic scaffold of these natural products. 
We also investigated the reaction energy profile computationally in collaboration with Ken House Group at UCLA. Our starting point was the acylperidinium enolate, which went through a syn-boat transition state to give the cis-monocyclized compound as a lower energy intermediate than the trans-monocyclized compound. The transition state energy difference between the trans and cis-monocyclized compound was only 1.5 kcals a mole, and by NMR we did see the formation of some of the trans-monocyclized compound. Next, the cis-monocyclized compound underwent the second cyclization to give the protonated all-cis tetracycle, which was nearly 10 kcals a mole higher in energy than the trans-tetracycle. Interestingly, however, was that the final deprotonation step had the highest energy barrier and was therefore the selectivity determining step for this mechanism. This was also supported by the lack of any other isomers isolated from this reaction. And by NMR, we could see that while the trans monocyclized compound was formed, it was also consumed during the course of the reaction due to the reversible nature of its formation. With a tetracyclic scaffold of these natural products in hand, we then turned our attention towards developing reduction conditions to access the unfunctionalized diamine. We initially found that we could perform the hydrogenation of the tetracycle using 1 mole percent rhodium on carbon to give us access to the bis amide in an 87% yield. Our first success at reduction of the bis amide to the diamine occurred with iridium catalysis, which gave a 37% yield. Interestingly, when we switched to lithium aluminum hydride in an attempt to boost the yield, which is a more canonical reduction agent, we only got a 36% yield of the monoreduction product. And it wasn't until we heated the reaction up to reflux that we were able to get a 42% yield of the desired diamine. Alang proved to be the most successful, giving us a 68% yield of the desired diamine. And we found that we could do the hydrogenation and then subsequently the alane reduction and then perform a purification at the end of this entire sequence to give 60% yield of the desired diamine via recrystallization of its hydrogen oxalate salt. We could also perform a tartrate resolution to give us over 90% EE and 24% recovery of the diamine. Now that we had the desired diamine in hand, we wanted to perform a selective CH oxidation to access the natural product isometrine. And we figured that this would be a challenging step, and spoiler alert, it was. In the biosynthesis of the matrine type lupin alkaloids, it's been shown that this diamine skeleton is selectively oxidized to the natural product. So we thought, Perhaps an enzyme can do this oxidation. And it's not known in nature what enzyme this is, but we thought maybe it was a P450 enzyme. So we teamed up with an Arnold group to evaluate their library of P450 enzymes. And we were surprisingly disappointed to find that over 180 different enzymes didn't give any reaction hits at all. Due to the failure of enzymes to give us any sort of product whatsoever, we thought that this process could occur aerobically in plant leaves. And there's plenty of oxygen and light around for this process to occur. So we tried to treat our diamine with singlet oxygen, but unfortunately we got undesired site selectivity along with a pimerization. And both experimental and computational evidence support that the carbon-hydrogen bond at C6 was the weakest CH bond, and that the DFT-computed CHIR stretching frequencies was actually a predictor of site selectivity in these and related diamine systems. Next, we turned our attention towards photoredox chemistry, and we thought that we could form the amine radical cation at the less sterically hindered nitrogen atom, which can undergo ready loss of hydrogen, followed by trapping by an oxidation reagent such as oxygen gas, to give us the natural product. Now, we initially tried out these conditions using a deuteration reaction in order to evaluate the site selectivity, but we started to see new spots by TLC, which was odd, as we weren't expecting to separate isotopologues by any sort of chromatography. And when we reran the reaction with hydrogen, we actually saw isomerization of the diamine skeleton. Now, we think that we are forming the amine radical cation at the desired site, but it can undergo ready inversion and then would be conjugated between both nitrogen atoms, which could allow loss of the weakest CH bond followed by addition of hydride to give back the isomerized diamine skeleton. The next thing we turned to was a Polonofsky reaction. From our research with the photoredox chemistry, we thought that we were accessing the least sterically hindered nitrogen selectively. And we found that we could indeed form the N-oxide selectively at that nitrogen atom in a 54% yield, and we figured a Polonofsky reaction could then give rise to the natural product. Now, unfortunately, using acetic anhydride, which was a traditional Polonofsky-type reaction, we got elimination at the undesired site, and when we switched to vanadyl acac, 
we ended up also getting a lower yield of elimination at the undesired site. And we realized when we looked at the X-ray structure of the anoxide that there's only a single hydrogen atom aligned perfectly antiperiplanar with the anoxide to undergo elimination, giving rise to the products that we observe. Now, we'd previously seen that we could selectively functionalize the desired nitrogen atom, which was adjacent to the site of oxidation in the natural product. And we thought that by forming a Lewis acid adduct to that nitrogen atom, we could perform a deprotonation and then electrophile trapping to access the desired site of oxidation. And we were really excited to see that we could get an 80% yield of deuteration at the desired site. However, when we switched to a simpler electrophile such as TMS chloride, the yield dropped down to 35%. We were able to get a 55% yield of an amino nitrile after trapping with trimethyl borate and then doing an oxidation reaction, and we were also able to get a 27% yield of a benzoyl ketone. We were really excited to find that we could perform a carbon-carbon aerobic bond cleavage of the crude benzoyl ketone to access isometrine in a 48% yield. We could also apply the same chemistry to the amino nitrile to access isometrine in a 46% yield. Now, what we ended up doing was optimizing a one-pot oxidation procedure directly from the diamine to isometrine in a 32% yield on small scale. And we found that this procedure, based on the benzoyl ketone, was better than the amino nitrile because this could be done in a single step instead of over the course of three steps. In the isolation of isometrine, it was shown that it can be isomerized into both matrine and allomatrine. Now, when we tried to reproduce these conditions, we actually got more natural products than the original authors found, which we took as a bit of a blessing in disguise and decided to try and optimize these conditions to access each of these natural products. Initially, we found that using rhodium and carbon gave access to matrine as the major component from this isomerization reaction. Palladium on carbon gave us access to allomatrine in an 83% yield, whilst Adams Catalyst allowed us to access sephordine for the first time in a 10% yield. Platinum on carbon allowed us to access isosephordine in a 55% yield, and if we used Adams Catalyst at a reduced temperature for a longer period of time, we isolated a diastereomer which has not been shown to be a natural product to date. So in summary, we've been able to cyclize pyridine and glutaryl chloride on a mole scale to access this tetracycle, which could then do a complete reduction, followed by a purification via recrystallization, and then a tartrate resolution to access the diamine in 90% EE. We could then perform a single-step oxidation to selectively access isometrine in a 26% yield on a 600 mg scale. From there, we were able to selectively isomerize isometrine into four additional natural products and one unnatural product. Lastly, I would just like to thank everyone who has made this project possible. I'd like to thank my advisor, Sarah Reisman, for being an awesome and supportive advisor. I'd like to thank Andreas Stegner and Bill Lamb for being awesome project partners and helping out with a lot of optimization of challenging chemistry. I'd like to thank David Miller and Francis Arnold for helping screen P450 enzymes in their library of enzymes. And I'd also like to thank Ken Hauk and Anita Turlick for their work on the computational investigation of the reaction energy profile. And lastly, I would just like to thank all of you for listening. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Jeff for joining us to share your chemistry. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.